Who made this sign down here? Okay. I would say that answer first. Well, I think it's only one inch. So you can and the back tracks don't quite look like three times as, as big as the front tracks. So I was kind of looking at those back tracks. So that makes it. Mm -hmm. When I said Dermana, I know that field guide. People have to point out the animal. John, Charles, and I got together and decided to call you all together. We decided that there was something very important to the three of us. I don't know why I got interested in tracking. People ask me what got me started. I have no idea. And I realized that there is something else, and that is the tracking of the self, the inner tracker. Coming to the essence of who we really are, discovering the fullness of who we are, or waking up as the planet, if you will. We didn't ask for any money for this because we didn't call it a workshop. That wasn't our choice of words, I don't think. Um, I think we looked at this as a conversation that needed to happen. Doing great. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. 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 We did agree when we were selecting people from our student list that we wanted people who were both trackers and inner trackers. I graduated from the Evergreen State College seven years ago. I live in Massachusetts and uh, I work at the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm from Dallas, Texas. I'm a uh, general contractor. Um, psychiatrist at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, my name is Paulette Roy. I'm Paul's wife, business partner. Uh, I'm an arborist uh, by trade and a tracker by trade part time. And uh, what do I do? I um, teach tracking and wilderness skills once a week to uh, a 13 year old boy. I'm Scott Eldridge. I live in Northwest Connecticut. And, uh, I teach mostly with kids. Um, I'm going to be teaching 7th and 8th grade science starting this fall. Uh, I'm sort of a professional student of tracking. I usually get paid to learn. <laughs> I work for an environmental engineering company. I'm a peacemaker for my tribe. I'm a temporarily, happily unemployed individual. <laughs> Can I make one point and then maybe go ahead and just ruin this all right now instead of waiting till later? Why did you come? Why did you come? Not why do you, what is it you want people to hear? Why did you really come? Certain people talk about inner tracking and they talk about spirit. And other people talk about inner tracking and it's not involved at all. In order for me to become a better human being, I have to face that fear and go to those places. And that's why I come here, hoping that this is what we are going to do. My name is George, and I live in Vermont. And uh, I thought this was a uh, Intro tracking class. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought we were just gonna be like learning how to measure stuff. Inner tracking. So I gotta think of some things to say. So. I mean, you don't have to look very hard at the world that we live in. 
to see all the conflict and hate, anger, pain in human relationship. I feel very deeply that that can be resolved. And I, I think that as I watch people get more and more effective as tracking teachers over these years, I notice that they learn it a lot faster than I did. I'm like, boy, we struggle to learn things and we can hand them to the next person so quickly. Modern science, the way it's practiced, um, works on the outer tracking but not on the inner tracking. And that it shows and that it's reflected in the society. I spent the first 40 years of my life learning how to balance people's neurochemistry. And um, about a year ago, woke up and figured out that I really didn't know what I was doing at all. So inner tracking to me is probably the exact opposite of what I've been doing for the last 40 years. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. And it's me re trying to remove ego and self of myself and staying in the moment. And we were to look at our student list accordingly. Who would be contributing to this conversation in a way that was not self-oriented? There are a lot of people here for a lot of different reasons. And there are a lot of egos here. Is the ego something, is that negative? Is it something bad? No, it sounds like it is. Do we in fact end up empowering the very thing that we're trying to get rid of by trying to get rid of it? Can this group come together as one mind in that energy that seeks the truth. And what's important to this group is to communicate. Not our beliefs about how it all is, not our self-importance, not our cultural or spiritual identities or enhancement. That's what I'm curious about. Would you like that? Turn the oh. Is that it? Is everybody here? Paul. Oh. No. Paul. No. Paul Rayfield's coming. Oh, okay. He's on Indian time. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize for being late. I had to go get my tractor clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> this is what's currently chic in the tracking world today. Would you like to? Do a little bit. <laughs> Bend down and point at the ground. <laughs> All right. I looked forward to this this gathering for for a long time when I started to really think about it. all the people that were going to be here and how many people that all of us have such a high level of commitment to what we're all here to discuss the art of tracking and hopefully inner tracking as well. I have looked to the native cultures around the world to find out how is it that trackers emerged? What was it that fostered their abilities? But my intention was never anything except to figure out how to make more trackers really efficiently. Because I know that if there was a tracker in every neighborhood, then really good things could happen. And the art of mentoring emerged for that purpose only. That was its purpose. And about nine art of mentorings ago, Paul Rayfield stepped into the picture. He was authentically connected to the way the elders held the space. Ironically, he was the first person um, who emerged here at this gathering uh, as someone who kind of hit a speed bump, so to speak. And so we bring it to you and ask you to suspend <coughs> your expectations and allow things to happen so that we can get into the conversation. Good morning. Good morning. Last night after we got done talking, um, I had the feeling that I didn't belong here, right? I listened to what people were saying and I said, I'm not sure these people even want to go to this place. But, you know, it's someplace I want to go, but maybe this is not the time and I just wanted to get out of here.
maybe I'm afraid that if I go to this place, you're not strong enough to hold the place that I want to be in. You know, this is coming now as I speak. Remember the first time Paul talked to you? Remember what he said? Remember what he said about why he came? He said he came to face fear, to go to that place. And I think in some ways what bothered Paul is, is that he felt that maybe you weren't going to go with him, that he was going to be there by himself. I think this is what's coming out now. Well, I have um, an answer for myself to that. And I don't know, I don't want to presume to speak for anybody else. But it's, it's, it's difficult to, to honestly and fully know the answer to that question without having more of a, a grasp of um, how you mean to go there. You see what I'm getting at? Yep. yep. I just have, um, it seems to me where people are talking about this place, <clears throat> and maybe it should be, we should talk about vulnerability like you were talking about. But, I mean, to question whether we are ready to be vulnerable with this group. And it's all about safety and feeling that we are safe, kind of letting down our walls, which we carry all the time. But the first step is really just committing to, the, to growth. When, when we come together at home and we do this, there's no intent of where, of what the subject is, eh? We come with a commitment that we come together and what's happening that we're gonna trust this circle that we're in. And where it goes, we're willing to take it. And nobody knows where it's gonna go. And it's not, you know, looking for a program. This is not a program. You know? There's another interesting thing here, Paul. Mark Elbrook touched on it a little bit. You know, he talked about growth. And usually when uh, tracking students come to a program, they're basically coming to get skills. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think that this is what this is all about. I don't think it's about growth. I think it's about examining that part of us that is always so busy about progressing, getting somewhere, getting more aware, getting more spiritual, getting something out of this session, acquiring something, growing. Maybe that mindset that's so concerned with growth and getting somewhere and getting more and consuming and acquiring is all about conflict. I have to get beyond the place of that where, you know, I'm ending and you're white, you know, and I still feel hatred, you know, with that. While you're talking there, what I'm just raising a question here, listening to what you're saying, and there's this eye that has to deal with all this, that seems to be separate from the problem. I don't understand. Yeah, maybe I should bring this up with me. Are you looking for my opinion? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Okay. There's a scene, your prejudices as they arise. And then there's this aspect of thinking that, well, I have to keep those prejudices, you know, they're getting in the way. That's my darkness, and I have to sort of control that. Because it's just getting in the way of communication. My, my question is, as I watch you say that, is who's the I 
that has to control this and not let this get in the way. How much is of it is mine and how much was put on me in my lifetime? Mm -hmm. How much is my, what I'm carrying, that I, I'm carrying because it was given to me and it's not even mine to carry. Yeah, well, who is you? How are you going to see this in an unbiased way? How are you going to assess your condition? Because if your condition is assessing the condition, then it's limited and it's biased and it can't possibly assess itself. I feel like I'm here in two very different camps here in that what you're saying is you let it go. You, there's, it's not a confrontation. And what you're saying is you've got to do this before you can do that. It's, it's, it's coming to an understanding of what it is. You can never let it go. I mean, it's going to come back around. I don't think there's different camps. I just think we're working on something. like to, if it's okay, play around with this. We have to have, first of all, a sense organ. So we have a sense organ, right? We have to have what? An object. And the other simple thing is that you have to have contact. And that is the simplest form of perception. And it would be nice if we could stop here. Ideally, this is where we want to be. Have we all been having pure perception with nothing clouding it or interfering with it? No. Probably very little. Even your sense organ is conditioned to see things in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And because it's conditioned to see things in a certain way, it's actually creating the object. Mm -hmm. 80% or more of what goes into the analysis of seeing comes from within the mind and the brain rather than from the eye. So we have a problem to begin with, don't we? You follow that? That's so hard to believe. I think what you're saying is that we're by nature prejudiced. We're by nature prejudiced and preconditioned and programmed to be blocked. And then we have something else that falls in here as well, and that's mental set. What is a mental set? What happens when you mix up cement and it's liquid and you pour it, and after a while it what? It sets, it becomes solid. These are the things that you believe. These are your systems. This is your cultural background. This is your religion. This is your academic education. These are your racial prejudices. These are your mental sets. Now, what does this triangle do in relation to this one? It taints it. <laughs> it taints it. Most of us see everything around us through this triangle. We can't see with just this one. We have to wade through this. There is our problem. You know, every time you see something, you've got that non-experiential knowledge and the whole, you know, all your history of experience, the mental set, all coming in and creating this human condition. It tries to strategize, it tries to transcend itself, it, it tries all kinds of stuff, but whatever it tries is from its basic condition. Can't get out of it. Nothing new can be created. So if something new is going to happen, where is it going to come from? To me, the seeing is the board, the white. All that is arising in the eternal the timeless, the unconditioned. Your basic consciousness that has no desire for anything to be other than what it is. I have a question about that research. 
Was that done cross-culturally? Is this a human, as you're saying, thing, mm -hmm. or is it a Western cultural American thing right. that we use 80% yeah. or that yeah. we're inputting 80% of the brain? Yeah. yeah. Drop uh, American, just Western. Yeah, Western. Is it sort of a presupposition that what we're here to do is to come up with a technique that all of us can then use in our own personal way or whatever to get up there? If, if we create a technique, mm -hmm. then we're screwed. <laughs> Aren't we screwed just by looking at the board? Of the <laughs> <laughs> As we wrote something on the board, we took the universe and narrowed it down to right here. That's right. Get it back I out here. warned you in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and does it make sense to try to get it back out here? It's already always that way. This is like this is really the crux. This is where people, where people We're get. We're on the so. edge here. Isn't uh, inner tracking still possible within the context of the lower right hand triangle? Uh, and th are there not, um, can you not arrive at, can you not arrive at some? Who's going to arrive, John? This is the question like, who's going to the party? We all want to go to this party yeah. of I'm being. Going, uh, uh, I would say the who is the individual self. Yeah, the condition. Yeah, that conditioned, that conditioned individual self. Uh, I, I, I think that there are, there are um, working truths within that inner tri that little triangle, at the bottom right. I think Paul's saying... He's got the stick. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm ready to give it up to anybody who wants to. I hate that stick. <laughs> What's going on, Charles, to make you hate the stick? Let's talk about it. Lunch time. Okay, something has come to my attention over the years as I've been mentoring naturalists. As naturalists emerge, I have seen again and again that something that I've been familiar with, not intimately necessarily, but pretty familiar with, like a red-tailed hawk that's been living in the neighborhood, suddenly appears to them for the first time. Did the red-tailed hawk exist before that person saw it? From my perspective, absolutely. Not to them. Not to them. But did it or did it not exist? Yes. When a woman who works at a farm that I live on takes a whole bunch of rat poison because one day she has a bad experience with a rat. She just has a scary experience, close encounter with a rat in a stall while she's cleaning a stall. She decided to take it upon herself to get a lot of rat poison. She didn't go down into the grocery store and get one box of decon rat poison. She got a stack of it. And she was proud to tell me how she got rid of the rats on the farm one day. As far as she was concerned, there were no red tail hawks. They didn't exist. Only the rats did, only in that moment. I happened to be watching a red tail hawk nest at that time, about, about a mile and a half up the hill. Within two days, there was no more hawks. To me, it was a tragedy. To her, it was a victory. And I wonder what my responsibility is. Because on the one hand, I'd like to say this conversation ends here. We're just bringing it all to the table, bust the whole thing, break open the bag, throw it on the ground, throw it all on the floor, sweep the table off and say, hey, we can't know anything. There's nothing to know. What if there are red tails and red foxes? And what if there are things beyond those and that we do have a responsibility to them? What if elders in different places were right? What if they knew something? <coughs> I recognize I'm in a cage, and I feel that's a big step, you know, I can see it, and I want a bigger cage. <laughs> <laughs> cage and you. Do we reach the whiteboard, or are we always going to have this filter? And if it's a filter, I want the one that John's talking about that a few elders have, you know, and it's not one for me in the sense, it's just, in my opinion, reaching one's potential. 
coming together as a group of people, I hear so many people um, expressing the desire to get somewhere, be someone, have something, is that I always want to say, you know, it's just all here. Nobody has to go anywhere, not something outside of you. It's just um, kind of in washing the dishes. The opportunity is always there to do the, the work of observing who, who you really are. Your story about the uh, rat poison really sunk through to me. I think um, I think I have probably hoarded rat poison in one form or another for a number of years. You know, frankly, I'm embarrassed and humiliated at the amount of time and energy I've spent protecting myself when I could have been, and protecting myself in a way that actually hurt other creatures and other living things. Inner tracking is not enough if I have no vision and make no application. And I don't want to talk about inner tracking without applying it to a purpose. And my students and I are tracking the bobcat. We're opening the door to intimacy the life of that animal. You can't avoid the fact, it's very difficult to avoid the fact. And how my species is living on the planet. And how I live my life is affecting the forest, the river, the mountain, the woodlands, the wetlands. This animal right on track. What's happening to this animal that I'm tracking in that forest is happening to me. There absolutely is no separation. That's the easy part of tracking. However, let somebody kill that animal in front of you. Let somebody destroy that river and cut that mountain up and drain the wetland. So you might not have so much compassion. Because you identify with being one with the planet. Because that becomes your identity of who you are. You're threatened when that's exploited. You're angry. You're hurt. There's fear. Because there's something you left unexplored. You became intimate with the wilderness out there, but you didn't become intimate with the wilderness within. So we begin to think of people who exploit the environment as bad. They see us as bad. And again, the Muslims see the Christians as bad, and the Christians see the Muslims as bad, and you know the scene. You didn't even get out of it. You just put on a different hat and a different ID. <clears throat> if you're, uh, you're a, you grow up and your experience is being a Catholic, then you're going to see the world according to that. And you're going to make judgments according to that. And the whole world is turned into bad and good according to that. If you are a tracker, if you want to ID with that, then the whole world is turned into bad and good according to that. You make your enemies, you make your friends, whoever is satisfying your image that you cop to. You are enslaved to that image. You're just a mechanical process you're just a mechanical image responding to whatever makes it feel good and whatever gives it pain, you respond accordingly. 
that how you want to live your life. I mentor trackers. And I know I'm going to bring 5,000 of them out across the United States to work in neighborhoods and to touch people's children in this manner that I'm describing just by taking them out and asking them questions. Um, Jen Jacobson accused me over dinner of being uh, too persecution, uh, allowing persecution to, to happen, so, um, to, my, to me. And I explained that's because I'm used to it. And part of it has to do with the fact that now, as I explained to Charles and Paul already, um, I have a mentor. I have several, but I have one in particular that's well known to most people here, um, named Tom Brown Jr. He expressed himself in this manner in 1994, and he says, "This I want you to meet John Young, and I want you people to know he is the only student that I have had the luxury to mentor exactly the way grandfather mentored me. And of course, that was like the end of my piece. Then all of a sudden, there was a lot of people who were sort of on me like tur flies on a fresh bobcat turd, you know that? <laughs> so I struggled with it for a long time. Because persecution, I will someday write the story of how persecuted I actually was. Because you'll be pretty amazed at the kinds of things that people in the 1980s and 90s will do to another two-legged human being who speaks English language and looks like them, dresses like them, and has a paycheck and a car. Even when it's not warranted. But I know what persecution means. I understand it. So, what happened... When I was about 27, I was terrified to explain anything to anybody about the things that were happening to me because whenever I brought them up, either my peers turned against me, my parents turned against me, my college professors turned against me, or the very once in a while rare time that a girl would listen to me, she would turn against me. Okay? And I felt like uh, whoever this dude was that raised Tom Brown, because Tom was having these same experiences. Passed this on to me, I felt that it was just pretty good revenge, in a way. Because it was undoing me, I have to tell you that. And it drove me to drink, literally, because I couldn't find <coughs> peace with my people. That I went to college with the idea of solving my identity crisis. I wanted to know if it's possible that such a thing could exist as Tom Brown, or the one that he claimed to mentor him. Because if that wasn't true, then I was just crazy and I was living a lie. Can you see that? It was heavy on my shoulders. So that's what drove me to study how Native people taught their children. Because I wanted to know where trackers came from. How did they emerge? I take them out in the woods. We wander around as if we're lost. And along the way, when something presents itself, I get into it with them. And I have fun with it. We laugh. We joke around. And then we get deep with questions whenever something presents itself. A track, a scat, an animal, a bird, whatever. And then we work it until they go deep with it, until they can sense what it is, put words on it themselves. So, 83, I had a handful of young people that I began to work with. And um, in 1984, uh, Ingwe joined up with me. If you haven't met Ingwe, you have to know. He was raised by the Akamba to be a medicine man. So he had some juju happening. He still does. <laughs> Never mind, it did. He does. He's a powerhouse, that old guy. And he's a beautiful man. We ran the risk of them hitting spiritual things and then not being able to do anything for them. Because we knew that trouble would start if we let them speak about it too much because then they would go home and say, but John and Ingwe agree with me. And then the boys would be ripped out of the program. We had to not encourage them. We had to not put thoughts in their head. Yet, they would all come to the place where they would absolutely rage against the white man's world. And that's what they would say. It wasn't my words, they weren't Ingwe's world. words. They were their own words. And what I was a 16-year-old boy, and I turned against my mother and father, my mother would say, That's that goddamn Tom Brown talking again! That's what she would say. And she would say, Everything was fine until you caught that snapping turtle on that street corner. Right? And ever since then, my life has gone to hell, she said. I could have probably buried it all and forgotten about it. 
had it not also the same things emerged in the students that I mentored the way Tom mentored me, if you know what I mean. So what's the burden? Okay? This is my burden. Paul? John? You can candle. introduce the candle. I was supposed to do that, I forgot. Over dinner, we were talking. One of the things that didn't happen and it was that we didn't start in the sacredness, which we can represent within this candle to look at the light within ourselves. And maybe that light within ourselves is really dim and we can't see it. Or maybe there's too much light and we don't see the darkness. So, my question is, do we light this? But it's by, you know, it's by consensus of everybody. Mm -hmm. We'll start here on the left, and we'll go around until it comes back to me. Even one person doesn't choose to do it, then we won't. Because it's not by consensus. Everybody has to agree. Okay. Ask a question, Paul? Mm -hmm. Sure. Why are you lighting the candle? Whenever we come together to do this kind of work, there's a sacredness that we need to begin with. You're intending on creating a sacred space? Right. Do you think it's in your power? It's not about power. You say you're going to create this sacred space. I think the sacred space comes when it wants to. I think it needs to, I don't think it's true. I feel that we're now standing on the edge of another awkward situation. Oh, let's do it. So, yeah, yeah, let's go there. Um, just say that I don't see a difference between sacred and not sacred. I think it was what we were talking about earlier where Everything is connected, so I'm neither for nor against it. I think it's a great idea. The fire is here whether we want it or not. If we could bring a symbol up for it. Just acknowledging it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that fire is here. It always has been. Somehow I feel like lighting this candle, sort of acknowledging that it is not, or it was not for me when I got here. Can you create... Make the sacred happen. And can you say that a consensus creates sacred? Sometimes it's not to question why or what we're doing. It's just to let it be. Well, that's what you said in the beginning, Paul. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you said that what was wrong is that we didn't have a sacred space to start with. Now we're talking about tradition and blindly following tradition. We're talking about mental sets, and I mean solid mental sets, that get just passed on from generation to generation and nobody ever questions them, and we're still killing each other over them. Oh, I see that too. There's two sides to it. But I think you're throwing the baby out with the bathwater, well, personally. Well, we're saying we got the good one and they got the bad one. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that I know I'm not seeking these elders. I'm not looking for some pie in the sky. I work with a holy man, Gilbert Walking Bull. And he doesn't get involved in the politics or anything else. He simply does what his ancestors taught him. And the salmon come back to a stream that they haven't been in in 13 years. And there's not one witness, there's 200 witnesses. And that salmon run is strong. And then he says, well, in case you didn't believe that, watch. And then the berries get thicker on the bushes. Not just one bush, but hundreds of bushes. 
all around the sweat lodge that Gilbert works at. Should I ignore that? Pretend it's not there? Because of the fighting thing, I agree. I'm very troubled by it, Paul, like you are. I'm very, very troubled by what's going on in Israel and, pa and Pakistan and India. I'm really, really troubled by it. I'm troubled by the persecution that I experienced Those growing are old, up. Old tradition. Uh, whatever they are, they were given to the people to keep alive by powers greater than me, greater than you. And I am not one to stand before the powers and question the wisdom of that. Even though they're killing each other? Gilbert's not killing anyone. Mm. What about all the other people with their traditions and their well, hey, formulas? And so because some people are killing uh, other people, does that mean that all traditions are bad? I don't see them solving the problems. Or does that mean this time we're living in, we're just fucked up? <laughs> you know, and, and back when the native people lived on this earth, they weren't fucked up, you know, and right now... They were killing each other. Our you minds, you, you know, they were, were not... They the same thing that we're doing now. You Only they had bows and they arrows, were. and they didn't have nuclear weapons. I don't know that, because I wasn't there. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the lack of... The lack of the acknowledgement of the Earth shows how messed up we are as a human race. That's, the, that's plain and simple. That's the only thing I'm talking about. The lack of the acknowledgement of this earth, that we are a part of this earth. We are a part of the, the trees. And that comes from tradition? No, that comes from, we aren't there. We are not there as a human race right now. But when we depended on the earth, when we had nothing else but to go out and hunt the animals and track and hunt the animals, we depended on that earth and we had no other, you know, we had no question that we weren't a part of that. And now, that's, that's not there, you know? We still depend on the earth. Of course we do, but it's like we've, there's been a major separation and we've gone up, you know? It's like, that's, it's just simple. I felt in the very beginning, like, what the candle was talking about. I, like, for me, it sounded like it was being talked about as an intention not really to create something. But I want to make sure that in this discussion and how it grows that we don't get stuck on religion and that we acknowledge that these things are really real. I mean, I, mean, I have so many stories. Here's one where I, I was with this fresh bear track and I knew exactly where to go to see this bear. And I, it was the complete opposite direction of where the bear went. And I went and sat there and half an hour later that bear came within five feet of me. Came out of the woods right next to me, wandered right by me, and I was just like, geez. This is all the kind of stuff everybody really loves. Right, but I mean, the uh, point to recognize our limitations. Those are not the type of limitations I'm really concerned about. Uh, I don't think that has anything to do with uh, human fear, or very little to do with it, the conflict we see in the world. The human conflict we see in the world. With that. To me, that's giving working through a fear, and I feel that a lot of trackers are afraid to go there, and that I feel is so relevant to what we're discussing. And because I've never heard you actually acknowledge any of these things, I wonder if you're afraid to go there, like, or if you just believe that I'm. Talking well, I'm not going to acknowledge them until they're real to me, and I have no interest in that kind of tracking. Because we get so caught up in that, and we think that's going to give us the answers somehow. When I track a bobcat, I'm not looking for an answer. You know what I mean? I'm just out there, and I'm just soaking in that trail. In fact, I ever probably never call it a bobcat until I get home and someone asks me what I did that day. It's just an experience all day long. So those kinds of experiences I'm talking about are just part of that package. There's no okay. goal. There's no answer. Okay. It's just part of my day, you know. It's Good. my meditation. Great. So, I, I don't know. It just seems like for you not to acknowledge them is somehow not, not to acknowledge part acknowledge, of them. Not to acknowledge what? That these things exist. To me, it's not valid because I haven't bothered exploring it. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter to me. Mm. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm getting interest. I'm interested in finding out what is the root cause of conflict. Why are human beings suffering? Why are we killing each other? 
I don't care if there's lines in the ground that I can track or not. I don't even want you to believe me. I want you to do what you've been doing. Question. Push the hell out of it. Until you either find out that I'm an asshole, or <laughs> wait a minute now. What's going on here? We'd go home a day early, we figured it out. <laughs> I've noticed several times where something would come up and we'd say, that's old, or that was then. I'm, a, I'm okay with that, but I've watched my dear friend and Uncle Gilbert get terribly prejudiced upon because people will hear conversations like this and then say, well, what does that old fool know? He's a fundamentalist and he's crazy. Then that's a mistake. Well, it is a mistake, but I think there's a responsibility in what we're doing here. And I'm sure if this room was filled with Native people, there would be a lot more upset than just me or just maybe Paul. I don't even know if I'm speaking for you, Paul, or not, but it strikes to my heart that so what if it's old? Did we, was the word old news? Yes. Yeah. yeah, it came out, at least how I experienced it, it came out almost as a retort to reject what had just been said. Where did it come from? Yeah, I didn't know that. There are some of us that are incredibly invested in our culture, our various traditions, religion, and we're going to tenaciously hang on to that. Because it's our security, it's our whole way of life, it's our whole way of thinking. It's a pattern that's set up, that has its own momentum, and it's tenaciously going to defend itself, protect itself. It does not want to die. What I'm sensing from you is that you see all of us experiencing something that somehow... Um, like a, like, phony is not the right word, but like a fake construct and that you're the only one that has the truth. I think that each of us is going to reach those potentials in our own ways and that what we're struggling for is to have our, our personal way, our personal walk validated. And, and I think all of us are doing that. We each want our walk, our that's tools what's happening. to be validated. And, and if I think that might be what's separating us from the leap. And I, I don't think that, that we're not concern. believing it either. I think we all believe that there is this potential, mm -hmm. that, that, we, that, that we are part of a, a greater wholeness and that we've become these bubbles. I think we, we can all agree to that yeah. on don't. some don't. level, and I won't speak for you, and um, I, I, my issues come up in that I I like the tools that I'm using and I also love to hear about other people's tools because maybe I can use them too but I don't want to be told essentially that my tools are useless you know I, I, I want some kind of validation that I'm doing good work even if I'm not there yet and all I'm asking now we're getting down to like what's really happening. All I'm asking is to have the patience because I'm slow. And I have to go through this process to get to where you're at in order to be in the level that you're at. And where you're at, Paul. My, my question is, is why, why do you need to feel good? I don't know. It's my biggest trap. It's my biggest stumbling block is the need to be validated by other people. Is that if I suddenly am not who I think I am through the eyes of all these other people, and I have to be who I am through my own eyes, Whoa. will I be anything? This you is, know, will this, I it's become all nothing? there. I, and that's a scary thought, you know? It's all there. I have a story about validation. And it's important that someone validates us. And I heard Mark say this. 
that he just wanted to be valid validated. The bubble by you. wants to but be validated. It needs validation because it's a false assumption. Mm -hmm. It's always seeking validation and security. It's frightened mm -hmm. as hell. But what it's the basics. It, it is fear. It is separation. It is anxiety. It wants to be. It, it wants to be substantiated because it knows fundamentally it absolutely doesn't exist. I don't agree with you. Actually, that's, that's if you're good. Speak for me, I just no, I will speak for myself. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. It was something that I needed in my life to help me get out of this place. Yeah, the bubble needs that stuff. And I'll just say one last thing about me being validated. Because <laughs> uh, I feel there are times when it's really good to be validated, and uh, there are times when it, I try to actually validate someone who I feel needs it. And, uh, but when I said what I did earlier, that I don't feel like you're recognizing part of me, when I sat back and said, that was totally the wrong thing to say, <laughs> and uh, it was a time that I certainly didn't need to be validated, but uh, because I don't really care. You know, my reality is my reality, your reality is your reality. And that uh, there are instances that validation is really just getting in the way. And um, you know, I think that I'll just put that out there because we've got a lot of discussion for validation. I'm, I'm certainly a firm believer that there are times when we just need to stand on our own two feet. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> oh, 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 it sounded a lot worse than it felt. <laughs> like I didn't feel it at all. Really. The hula dancer was shaking. <laughs> What's going on, Charles? Make you hate the stick. It's fun. <laughs> Why do you feel these things? And the stick has no value. Because when you hold it, people start talking that it has, holds no value, so... We couldn't even discuss what, what to do with the stick earlier, you know, we got the stick taken away from us. Because we <laughs> couldn't oh. appreciate the, the beauty of the stick. Um, when you put the stick into the center, because it wasn't being honored, I felt like it was my heart that was out there. We either mindfuck ourselves to death, or or we pay attention to why we're really here. We're going to honor the stick. Then we need to do it right. I used to second guess the elders. Then I got my butt kicked. This is my burden. But it's also yours, if you follow this routine. Isn't going towards the candle skipping going down that hill? <laughs> we don't have to go towards the candle. Charles and I don't really feel like anything much is happening here. There's no real work happening here, folks. That's what we see. When you uh, talk about the fire being sacred, you quoted Ingway and three or four others. Mm -hmm. Do you believe the fire is sacred? Absolutely. What if elders in different places were right? What is our responsibility as trackers? And we feel like some of you are just chasing, chasing visions and think that other people have all the answers. We think the answer, if this comes in that form, is in yourself. When you only think about yourself, it's easy to let go. It's easy to be existentialist and philosophical and throw the whole thing out the window. You know, like what Mark was saying, the vision and the purpose, you know, I'm not willing to let go of that. When you go to somebody else, you're just escaping the real fundamental work that you have to do, and it's that comes face to face with yourself and your limitation. This is going to sound very strong, but at some point, I think about the same point, Charles and I were just feeling like we needed to puke. But I don't think that the three of us can talk about the subject matter that we've agreed on the way things are happening around this circle. And there is that, that conflict of, well, who's right? Who's wrong? Which side do I take? There is no side. As soon as there's a side, you're on. It's to let go of whoever the book writers are. What is the fear that sits within you 
Charles and Paul. Because it seems to me that's where it comes from. Oh, man, I can't believe it. Are you kidding me? I'm sitting here looking at the same thing and you. <laughs> so can, we, can we let the candle go and go on down instead of turning off to the candle? Can we go on down? Where is the fear? I don't want to be involved in creating another whole bag of imagery about how we're going to save the world. I think we need to save ourselves, understand ourselves, then maybe something will happen. This freedom will never happen that you speak of. I don't think it's going to happen, Paul. And, and conflict and wars will never cease. I don't think that they will. Mm -mm. So why give energy to something that's unresolvable? Because I'm a fool, Paul. I am an absolute asshole. And those are the best words you said. <laughs> well, that's exactly it. Because, because I'm a fool and I keep talking to the wind. Right. I have the same concern. We're all very afraid right. of that. So or I think most of us are. So do the Christians. So do, you know, and we got to get out of this. You know? Right, so but it's the same concern. We all have our heart in the right place or we wouldn't be Everybody has their heart in the right place. So for you to go to bed... Feeling like it's hopeless is going to make me feel worse tomorrow. <laughs> this is the talking bag. Okay. And I have it. It's in my possession, so I get to start. Don't we all have to agree to that first? <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> well, let's start with the microphone. Yeah. Let's, let, let's go around the circle and see if everybody agrees with that. And you each have 30 minutes to discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> to give them... Oh, no, I was going to tell you to tell them. Quite honestly, I went seeking him last night because I, I got hot last night. You may not have noticed that, but but I did, and and I felt bad because I like him. He's, I, I think he's a friend, and he said some good things. I went and said, you know, are we okay? And what did you say, which is really great? I don't, I don't remember. I think I just said what you wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I think you said no, but that wasn't what I wanted to hear. <laughs> So because I didn't understand it, I was relating it to the times when I was in school. At boarding school, they'd preach to you, and it was preaching. Because I couldn't understand it. Nothing was going in. It was going all over. Do all of you realize what he went through in boarding school? I have no idea. That's what, see, some of these people have no yeah. idea what you went through. Paul. There was a lot of abuse, physical abuse, and there was sexual abuse. And, you know, personally, I can speak from... You know, where I was taken at one time and grabbed by the back of the head like this and bent over, and the nun just literally started beating me on the back until I couldn't breathe. Eh? Now, I was in like in the fifth grade. And it's because my job of cleaning wasn't up to par to her. And so there was dust behind. And so I got beat for that. And if we didn't understand something, we got beat for it. We got smacked in hands with rulers. We got our ears pulled in from the time we were sitting down and lifted up. And we were standing on our toes being ripped. You could hear your ear go. You know, there were certain people, Indians that went there that didn't look like Indians that got treated different. We need to bust through walls. We need to get through things. We need to pull things out and look at them. Because last night, you know, what was happening for me was I wasn't so much feeling persecution from Charles, which is what Charles was concerned about this morning with me, I was concerned that persecution was happening and people weren't acknowledging it. That's what I was concerned about. Because it is happening. And I know, you, you may not like this. You know what? It doesn't, I don't care if you like it or not. I take people tracking and I bring them through the art of questioning and because of that they trigger into a whole spiritual dimension and then stuff happens to them. You, you may not want to hear that, and you may not like that. <coughs> Everybody ready? Everybody ready for this? That's what you see about.
and forgive me for being personal, but it's um, it's very relevant to, uh, at least I, I believe so, and hopefully you'll be able to see some of the things of how it's relevant to the conversation that we're having here. So I'll just start off the story back with the, uh, the Christian Brothers Academy days when uh, I was going to school there and just entering into school as a freshman there. There was this program there. They'd all be sitting in a circle. We'd sort of get them to each tell a story of what they saw while they were sitting there. And you could track things that happened, like a hawk flew over and this bird made this sound and that bird made that sound. See, the birds communicate and you can understand it if you listen. I went from hockey captain to a long-haired hippie type guy wearing wool around, carrying a walking stick around with feathers on it. <laughs> and the world was totally, my world was becoming very altered and changed by the moment that I would start really just being out in the woods for very long periods of time and uh, seeing synchronicities in the land and talking to my friends in a way that they just thought was kind of cool. Um, um, I was really starting to move way out into the woods and I really couldn't relate to many people at this college at all, meaning that it was kind of uh, like a very preppy type school and meanwhile I'm still walking around with my walking stick with feathers on it, still have my long hair and wool uh, shirt on. All of a sudden I started to find myself in a, in, a, in, a, in a story, like a very mythological type of thing. I was beginning able to see things that were not really being seen by other people. Um, finally, I ran into my parents because they didn't really know what was happening to me. So they took me to talk to this other guy and he said, hey, just, you know, you better might want to just take him to um, the hospital. You know, they inject this thing in within me because they think that they, uh, it's going to help cure me or whatever. And, they put me in this room and it's like this stuff flows through my body and I could feel whatever was with inside of me just kind of like being killed out of me and it's like a very painful uh, experience and it was like this death going on and I mean I'm just crying and in pain. If I happened to be there at that time, I would have helped him get all that under control and, that, and he would have continued to have these deep spiritual experiences but I would have told them not to tell anybody about it because they'll try to kill you. And that's exactly what they did because that's what happens in this culture. I feel that we can call this what we're doing inner tracking. What's happening to me, I feel, is inner tracking. I can't just go from here to here. It has to be through the heart. And I really feel like this morning, like that's where we're all at in our hearts. And it feels really good to me. <clears throat> um, let's see. This is sort of where we're at, as I understand. So this is where I'm at. <laughs> I really want the truth. And, you know, Paul Rosendez, when I met him, I just thought I knew absolutely nothing about track. And uh, you know, he was the first person to pat me on the back and say, hey, you've come a long way. <laughs> and uh, so that was really incredible for me. But he also said, you know, let's push this community knowledge. Let's do that. And so I did. As I said, when I first started, I'd just go track. You know, there was no agenda. I just went out and whatever happened that day is what happened. That was great. And eventually just started having these incredible experiences weird things, you know, simple things, nothing, nothing like George. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> and then I became more data-driven because I was pushing the boundaries of our tracking community knowledge and felt that I wanted to measure things that have never been measured before. <laughs> <things like that. laughs> and the last four or five years, I've been measuring crazy amounts of stuff. <laughs> and, and, uh, whereas before that, I was just tracking. And it's funny, those kinds of experiences started to happen less and less. To have those kinds of experiences was so powerful for me, just tracking with no agenda. But what I felt inside me was sort of a, a struggle in the sense of, I, I wonder what would have happened if I had done five years more of that stuff instead of data-driven work. And it kind of made me sad, you know, because I don't know, and I'll never know.
even though we've got you know a very comfortable circle going around here and the walk out of here comfortable and all I don't know how comfortable I can be with each step of my life when I'm fearing the next conflict because I know they come back around in different forms really glad to hear people feel people speaking from their heart just really glad I just don't I don't no, maybe it's just because I can't understand some of this stuff, but I feel like sometimes that's just chasing our tails and find myself getting really frustrated with it and not understanding how that's going to help walk, uh, be a better person, walk a good path. Uh, some people don't like those terms, but that's what I try to do with my life. And, um, and chasing an intellect around my head doesn't help me do that. So I'm glad to hear that people are speaking from their heart and that we're starting to work on things. Last night seemed uh, kind of hard, pretty uncomfortable, yeah. at least for me. Most of yesterday, probably. I think you had a lot of opening up today. I, I feel good about it. But I'm not sure that the net effect is we haven't just given ourselves a class group hug and haven't really gotten down to the, to the hard work that, that ultimately I think is going to move the class to, to a different place. So. We've got less than 24 hours. Let's see what we can get done in the next 24 hours. Let's really go to work on it. I'm going to give you a subject, right? Maybe the subject will help. You ready for this? In a sentence with a slash in it. Now, I know that gets complicated right away. <laughs> Knowledge is limited. Slash. Got that? Knowledge is unlimited, period. Okay? Is that a contradiction? Are they both true or neither? Is there knowledge which cannot be learned? But either way, is that knowledge attainable somehow, or can it never be reached? When the baby's born, its body has the knowledge of how to turn mother's milk into eye cells and skin cells and things like that, but it's not something it learned. Or maybe maybe it did learn it, but not in the ways that we often think of learning. Now, to me, knowledge is in all different kinds of levels. So knowledge can be conscious and unconscious. Yep. DNA or the verbiage in your head. But uh, emotional, emotions or knowledge. Uh, now, see, see, that's a good one. Sometimes we think emotions and feelings are separate from the stuff in our heads. The psychological fear, and then there's a mountain lion, so you see a mountain lion charging directly towards you. We call that shot of adrenaline fear. We get full of it, and if we don't do something with it, we're going to be shaking like crazy. That's why when you get angry, you have this fight, flight, and you start to shake, and that's why sometimes, to me, cops end up beating the shit out of people and pulling them out of their cars because after that chase at 100 miles per hour, they're so full of adrenaline, they can't help themselves. They're driven. they got to do something with that. Most of them are just going to be shaking here and they're not going to be able to do anything. Is that fear or is it rage? Well, there's, well, I don't, to me, it's a response. The self is threatened. Somebody says, you're an asshole. You know what I would have done in my earlier days? I felt threatened, I felt vulnerable, and I'm going to show them I'm not vulnerable. There's fear. And that triggers the same response as the mountain lion coming, only now it's psychological fear. fear. My identity is threatened. My body is really not, there's no threat to my body at all. But it's having the same response in my body. That feeling of fear is not separate 
from the whole assumption of who I am. If I didn't have an assumption that I was somebody important, I wouldn't be hurt. What about the inherent knowledge? Yeah. Something that's coming to my mind is uh, I'm kind of wondering what types of knowledge are there? You know, are there different types of knowledge or are we just putting knowledge as knowledge? What is the knowledge that other knowledge you started to touch upon that when a young child is born, there's this knowledge of this ancestral knowledge? Inherent all, knowledge. Yeah, inherent knowledge. It's all these experiences that aren't me, that are in my DNA, that are of these relationships of all this way of living that was well beyond before me, beyond the knowledge of self. Because if I look at the knowledge of self, and that's all I've got, and I live within the knowledge of self, there's that other knowledge. Oh yeah, and then there's knowledge that is forced upon you, whether you want it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, well, that's a that's a really good point. What I mean, what knowledge isn't? Is there some knowledge that isn't forced upon you? Oh yeah. Oh boy, that was quick. That was a really quick response. <laughs> Tell me about the knowledge that's not forced upon. You. The knowledge when, you seek. The, is why it? do you seek it? Be Paul, careful here. I think we better. I think we're really. I'm sorry, I just think we're really at an important spot here. When you seek something, or you make a decision, why did you make the decision? We're going to come, we might come into this very, very mechanical, limited world. And we, we might not want to go there. I know <laughs> that there is a spirit world. When I was a kid, I saw ghosts all the time. And it wasn't my imagination. Okay, this, be careful, please, because this is a place we might be avoiding. Do you mean that you don't want to go down this road? <laughs> no. right there may be people who do, there may be some of us, or part of us, that doesn't want to go down this road right now. So, I'm just well, raising I, in a caution flag. I, I, this doesn't seem like a very cautious group to me. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but I, it raises a question for me, just uh, off the top of my head, that um, your response, it, um, do, are you suggesting that there is no, there is no free will? Can we go down? I see where we're going with this. I think we're moving towards this point. Why would we, why would one seek knowledge? Something like along those lines. Who's seeking knowledge? Why seek knowledge? Something I'm thinking about is what is natural knowledge? Okay, which isn't like some constructed thing, which isn't like school or a book. Natural knowledge, which. Um, if I look out the doors there, looking outside through beyond everybody, I really can't construct that out there. You know, that's just there, right? Um, oh, wow, well, you just opened up the camera. Oh, good, let me well, keep let going. Me finish. All right. Now, if I look at a Bushman or a Kalahari, or someone living in a native setting, there's conditioning going on. There's a cultural model that's there, but it's based on different things. And their knowledge that they're looking for is a knowledge of survival, right? I'm seeking knowledge in order so that I can survive and my people can survive better. Yeah, knowledge is basically survival strategy. Why does you, why does someone go to college? Right. To okay. Get knowledge. Good point. To because it's a survival strategy. Right. That's the way I have to survive in this setting now. Right. This is the survival strategy that people are living with. So I go right through the whole system because that's all that's there and I go through to get a job, and that's how I make a living and how I survive, right? It's all happening to you. Right. If you're just with it, if you're just going through the system. Well, when you resist it, why do you resist it? Well, resisting it, resisting that, creates conflict with everything else that is expected. But if, if you resist it, then isn't that a pro coming from a knowledge? 
a program is cre creating that reaction to resist. Yeah, I know. I feel like it's a different yeah. program, though, that's going it's on. It's a different program. There's another yeah. program in there that's Programs like... can get in contact with each other, too. Yeah, but it's a program that isn't a creative program by someone else, you know? Or something, like, if I look at the system out there that everybody's in, it's a very, like, thought-based system. This other type of knowledge that I'm talking about is something that's inherent within us, and it's colliding. It's, a, it's colliding with it. So did the ancestors who had this knowledge, was it part of their thought? I mean, we know this is thought, because this is you know, our culture, whatever, that, we've, that we're here. So is this ancestral knowledge different? Because you're, you, I kind of feel like you think it's different. It's in my blood, in my DNA, you know? which are, isn't just this native hunter-gatherer knowledge, there's all this other stuff too. So I think there's just a long line of things that are within me that I'm calling ancestral knowledge, you know, whatever my people were Is that, that came together to create me. limited condition? That's all conditioned too, yeah. you know, because those people are making thoughts about different things that's and they're creating stuff too, you, right? How you were thinking about Right. I mean, that's all part of it, too. There's where, you know, the, all that stuff is there in the reservoir of who we are. Mm -hmm. And that reservoir, I don't think, is separate over there and separate over here. I think we're all in that pool. We may see our bodies separate, but there's that pool, we're all sharing, it, sharing in the same pool. Like when we experience fear, we don't experience our own personal fear. We experience that fear that is human fear. Right. It's, it's all the same fear, of the, okay? Sometimes certain things can happen in your life and you have all this in you, this incredible reservoir is going to erupt sometimes in certain ways. You take drugs, you do Kundalini yoga, you sit and sit and sit in your spot, you're a Zen Buddhist meditating, 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 all of a sudden you're going to have an incredible experience a vision. Something's going to happen. It's going to erupt out of that pool. There's going to, some kind of synchronicity can come out of it, some kind of this and some kind of that. I don't think a drive to know how to caretake the earth is an illusion. I don't think it should be considered that, and I don't think it should be viewed on the same level as the desire to seek a knowledge that's destructive. We were talking, and we were beginning to see that thought had limitations, and it can only go so far. And we started to talk about that whole wellspring and how, you know, our visions come out of the air and everything, and all of a sudden, maybe it sounds like, whoa, wait a minute. And that means our visions are limited. But what I thought I saw was John immediately move in defense of a certain aspect of thought, what was it called? Inherent. Inherent <laughs> thought was immediately seized upon to be protected from this possibility of being limited, biased, and prejudiced. And to be made absolute, something we can't question. It's what we're going to live by. It's the way. That's, folks, what religion is made out of. If it wasn't for the pictures I held in my mind, you know, and what I saw for myself, you know, and I have gone from the darkness of living on the streets and, you know, dealing drugs, to, you know, coming out of that. And when your freedom and when your salvation depends on something like that, it's limited, it's dependent, and it's really not freedom. I know that I see the people that we work with, and I see that in many ways they are becoming like robots. That, you know, no matter what they're doing, you know, at least now they're doing the Thanksgiving address instead of you know, playing video games. And I don't care if it's 
conditioned, I'm preconditioned to do this, or it's complete free will, I don't care. There could be a life that's hanging in the balance, and maybe I just want to be cool and say, oh, I saved this kid's life. And if that's what's going on, I'm disturbed by it, and I can't be part of it, because my whole life is dedicated to exposing those limitations, because I see that is very problematic in the world. Thank you. And I explained to Paul that I wasn't rushing to defend it because I agree that even what I would call vision is limited, biased, and prejudiced based on my perceptions of it. So I wasn't actually defending it. As I explained, what I was doing was saying, what about inherent thought? Does it have a value even though what he's saying is true? But I'm also a little less fast on the draw to shoot it down dead. I don't know where you, your heat-seeking one-track focus on destroying anything that appears that way comes from. But I'm not quite as, uh, well, what feels ruthless in a way. You know, like I'm going to stand back and look at it and see if I can get something out of it before we shoot it dead. All I'm simply saying is I, I am in firm agreement with that woman, Conway, who did the research that resulted in the book Snapping, when she said that it seems to me the only safe place to condition the mind through the senses and through mind focus was nature, because the ending reality shift that comes out of that, at least we can't say somebody's ego or someone's religion is, is grappling with that. So my <coughs> only concern is that we facilitate enough sensory contact and input with nature, mind focus on nature, that there'll be that snapping of a consciousness that suddenly says, whether it's an illusion or not, wow, I'm one with this whole thing, I better take care of it. That's my religion, in a nutshell. Well, what's a, I think I'm kind of happy because now I feel like I can say something that doesn't sound like it's contradicting, John. <clears throat> I think once, if we can get to the place where we can see that and embrace the fact, and really understand, not embrace it because we think we should. But, and I don't, I'm not sure we've done this at all, but if we can get to the place where we really understand the limitations of thought, and we can accept that, then we can also see the place of thought. Then we can also see the value of knowledge. In some places it applies, and in some places it does not apply. One of the things I need to do to get there is if something comes into my mind and I have the question of, was well, this a form of knowledge that's unlimited? I need the freedom to be able to explore that for a while. I think you should absolutely explore it. And I thought I premised a lot of the things I said, and I don't want anybody to just accept what I say. I want everybody to find out for themselves whether it's true or not. And it's very true to what you say, that sometimes I cut people off too soon. When John was talking, um, I mean, I've heard Paul say these same things for 20 years. Because Paul can be really passionate, and because it's, he's always trying to get people a question, that people do react to that like, oh, brother. He's just like knocking everything down. And by one thought I had was something that John said that kind of um, clicked with me when he said that somehow I think there's, an, there's some kind of message getting out that when Paul says if something's limited, he's trying to destroy something. I wonder if that is truly synonymous. And, and John was talking about the value of things. I don't think seeing that something is limited means that it's not valuable. And I think sometimes listening to Paul, that sounds like what he's saying. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I mean, I know from my living with him and I know from my experience as well that, that that's not at all what he's saying. That's, it's just that let's go and just look at the limitations. It doesn't mean that it's not good, it's not bad. We're just going to look, we're going to observe, we're going to learn. Um, kind of look at the things that sometimes we don't want to look at because they 
they're frightening or you know maybe it's really going to call up questions that whoa you know i mean i'm, I'm, I'm not ready you know and sometimes we're not going to be ready to look at some things if in fact it's true that there is no thought and there is no thinker what is it that would keep me from you know, skinning all the buffalo, cutting down the trees, ripping you guys off. Like, why should I care? You know, if you're caught up in thinking that you're the thinker and I'm not, then why not just like go for everything you've got and cruise? At, 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 some point, at a point in our life, we're only filled with self-concern. That bubble can only know self-concern. I can't know anything else. The basic quality of this other energy is non-interference. It is the passion for truth. When we, when there is in us a selfless passion for truth, it doesn't care whether the truth hurts or whatever it is. It just wants to know what the truth is. It wants to communicate and understand. And when that brings to light our condition, which is suffering, pain, anger, fear, inner conflict, and the source of that is discovered. You can't help but well up with compassion for other human beings because you know what they're going through. And you will sit until you are blue in the face to set them free. But you know you're not going to set them free. You know that they have to go there themselves. But man, there are so many distractions. And self just tenaciously hangs on The bubble just holds on to everything it has. It's all it knows. And it's going to accomplish that freedom. It's going to accomplish wisdom. It's going to accomplish humility. It's going to accomplish spirituality. And it's going to find the right way to teach those kids. Some of that is going to be very instrumental, thought it's going to be very instrumental in teaching those kids. But boy, it better get clear first. Because mostly all those kids are getting fed the bubble. The dichotomy, if we teach them just how to identify with nature, and that they're one with nature, we haven't made them whole. They still have that inner dichotomy. And when they start to identify with nature, they're going to get very frightened, very angry, very threatened when somebody threatens nature. Because now they're getting threatened. You made them fall in love with nature. And now somebody's killing nature. They're getting killed. They, you're setting them up. You also got to set them free. They got to have compassion for the people who are killing nature. Because those people are horribly frightened. The same fright, the same identification with the nature, the same fright those kids have, those people who are killing nature, that's the same mentality. They're frightened too, but they have a different image. They're identifying with something else. And they think you're bad, and you think that they're bad, the Muslims think the Christians are bad, and the Christians think the Muslims are bad, and we're all killing each other because we're horribly frightened, and we're, oh God, I'll go on and on, I'm sorry. Over and out. Roger, copy that. When we reside in the the wholeness of who we are, you know, when we've kind of put the, the little self, the self concern aside, and we 
kind of reside in what I would say is the real us. Once you know that, you you just it, you live your life differently. If everything is me, then how I treat everything, how I, I mean, I love me. I'm gonna. Uh, I mean, I love everything. Then. With that, then everybody caretakes the earth because the earth is us. With earth, we're each other. And if there's no separation from it, then. You, you, you live your life in a different way. Like I feel like we arrived at a place where I'm like, yeah, exactly. That's what I'm trying to say <laughs> this whole time. That's exactly what I'm trying to say. So now I feel like we just beat each other up to get to the same place. <laughs> we're both concerned that we're not going to turn people against people because they, we want them to fall in love with nature. That's, that, that isn't where I was coming from. I don't think anybody here that I know is coming from that place. I'm in the same business. I've been in the same business for a long time. And sometimes I'm only able to help people come to the wholeness in respects that they wake up as the planet, but they still have this inner dichotomy. And that's a place to begin, but boy, you're right. You have to be so careful at what we're doing and I'm, I'm kind of almost overjoyed in a sense because I mean ultimately I thought the reason we got together was to come together and figure out how do we share this with other human beings? How do we go about doing this together? Uh, over and out. I've been a student of Paul's for a long time, and uh, he's been a wonderful teacher. Uh, in fact, I feel a little choked up um, just attempting to uh, begin to acknowledge If I'd known I was going to do this, I wouldn't have started. <laughs> I continue for all my genuine uh, interest in truth to be apparently quite befuddled. <laughs> <laughs> Close to 9.30, and I guess we had an agreement that we would try to cut off by 9.30 on most nights, and last night we went entirely too long. And we got we got 15 minutes. What do you want to do? We could do charades. <laughs> I have one thing I want to throw out there. Maybe if I struggle, maybe John can help me. It's a question to everybody that that place that I really don't even feel like describing because um, Paul and Paulette already did. Okay, we all have one thing in common, right? We all, in one form of another, follow animals, whether it be the tracks on the ground or the sign they leave in the forest, right? That's why we're all, we're all invited here, because we have a basic understanding of that, right? How is the outer landscape a reflection or a mirror to your inner landscape? When you're at that place, how does the outer landscape respond or not respond? Does that make sense? The experience of that oneness feeling within. Yeah. How does the outer landscape respond at that time? It's in comparison to say, let me know for when you're not in that place. Yeah, so like, when you're really in your bubble. Yeah, yeah. When you're really like letting your bubble just take charge, you know, and just like fully in that. Gotcha. Okay. If you are one, then there is no longer an inner or an outer landscape, is there? <laughs> <laughs> All right, good night, everybody. <laughs>
So I guess what I would be responding to that was, when you are one, what does that look like? You know? What does that look like? What is what is what happens? How do I move? You know? It looks like that. <laughs> well, I have a question about that. My question is, when you go to the place where you are one, do you stay there, or do you glimpse it? Are there are there um, places that are on the way to those glimpses? Jen, I'm sorry. I know it's, it's I know that it's I don't need an answer because I've got all these answers for you and they're just smart ass uh, <laughs> stupid jokes. I think that's entirely unique. Entirely unique to a person. Uh, sometimes get a little flash and it just knocks me upside the head so I don't get any any warning it's just stars afterwards um, and I, I know that if I continue to give answers it would seem like that would just set something for somebody else to look for right. and it would rob them of their own personal experience very good just say that again. Uh, rewind. <laughs> <laughs>
And if I'm already there, why even bother doing it? When you're a little kid, the first thing your parents ask most of you is, what are you going to be when you grow up? What are you going to be? And you think, oh, I'm going to be a fireman. Why did you want to be a fireman? You wanted to be a fireman because it was awesome to you. You know, and that guy was like, you looked up to that person, and he was awesome, and wow, he was a hero. and. You want people to see you in that light. And that's just power. That is all seeking power. That's why Charles says, and John says, I'm not a trekker. You just, when you say that, you're just denying the authority and the image. I'm not really that, I'm more than that. <coughs> kind of what it is that we don't recognize that we set up images. And so then in relationship, all we're really doing is connecting with the images. Well, you know, I'm the track or on whatever names and images we want to put on ourselves but that truly that's just a very small piece of the puzzle a very little bitty corner of the full picture to kind of get back to what Jim was saying I believe that yes Paul whether he admits it or not that there was a way in which he began to look at his life and that the process that he used continues to use is what I guess some of us would call self introspection look at everything thoughts feelings in the moment just observe without judgment so the thing is is that you don't want to see then set up the process as the rule. There may be a zillion ways of understanding that. Like what if you have absolutely no concept idea, you don't intellectualize, and I think this is where, you know, sometimes the language is difficult, you know. So I think to myself, okay, so you got some some native person off in the jungle somewhere. Does that person have the understanding, without words, of what the fullness of life is? The eternal, or God, or whatever you want to call it, whatever name, because we try to communicate, we're using words. I believe that that is possible. It has to be. Even though you say it's not the process, but there has to be a process to get there. There has to be a way to get there. You just don't just say, all right, I'm going to go there, and then I'm there. So there's a way for me to travel there, in my way, to get to this place. It's unattainable. And then Paul spoke again, which just turned everything upside down, which confused me. It set me back to yesterday, or the day before. And because I'm not understanding it, he says, well, I don't want to go there. So in other words, it's telling me because I'm in this place back here, forget it. But I'm back there. So, at times I'm in this, I'm in this conversation, I understand it. And I understand where I want to go. And then, he speaks of authority. Of letting it go, but... See, his authority and my authority is different. My authority that I look is authentic authority that which means that as an author to tell a story or to bring out what's in me already. So there's times I understand and I say, yes, that's exactly what I'm doing with my life and what I'm trying to achieve in my life. And then I say, yeah, I agree with Paul. I agree with you. I understand that. Yes, that's what I'm trying to do. Then all of a sudden, it's blowing out. And I said, wait a minute. And because I'm set back, then Paul says, you know, well, that's, you know, the other night, or whatever he said. But that, if that's where I'm at, and he's not willing to go where I'm at, I'm there. Are you, you're not willing to come back to where I'm at and to help me, then... This whole thing is 
pointless. If I go to this place and you're not strong enough to hold this place, what happens to me? And so, you know, that authority that you speak of, I'm thinking... That's a totally different thing. Don't right. Con don't let that confuse you. That but authority, it did. And but, well, don't. It's, it totally doesn't mean anything to you. It means all the wrong stuff to you. It doesn't communicate to you, Paul. That word doesn't... We don't, we don't think of the same thing. When you're thinking of that word, you're thinking of something different than what I'm saying. On one-to-one, -one we can come to this. But you yeah. speak in a different level in a group which changes your language. We're actually feeling like maybe you two are in agreement about what inner tracking is and that somehow I'm outside of that. You just express yourself differently with Charles and I and you express yourself differently with the students and Charles and I are not getting through to the language that it's the same thing and we don't get it. And maybe everybody here it has the mind that you're in. So my mind isn't there. And it's hard for me to... You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I think we need to take a few minutes here to... I just want to honor Paul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> do you realize what this guy's trying to do? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think. No. <laughs> I mean... Yes. Talk about facing fear mm -hmm. and... So sometimes it sounds like you're saying a totally different thing, but it actually means the same thing. And it's, uh, I mean, to me, a very fascinating study. Um, and why I get upset when there's like word games, because I just want to know what's being said so it can be relayed to my brain. Throw out the language and let's just all role play because we're all talking about the same things and I just want to be able to envision what you're talking about. So. And you go to nature, Matt brought this up earlier, you go to nature, a lot of that drops away. It becomes less of a problem, right? The same problems are still there. You are confronting new languages. They're simply non-verbal. Mm -hmm. Like, what if you have absolutely no concept idea, you don't intellectualize? Does that person have the understanding, without words, of what the fullness of life is? You still have to learn those languages. Now, those languages are innate. They reside in our souls, in many ways. But we've lost the ability to read those languages. So we still have the problem of relearning them. I can't tell you that I know this language. I can't tell you that I can read and speak this language eloquently. And I have literally been working with trying to understand this language of nature for over a half a century. I'm just now beginning see some things. I believe that that is possible. It has to be. Somebody came to me well, was sometime Saturday in the, I don't know, with Georgia. I said, oh my God, you know, this is like a microcosm of the whole world in here. Here we are, three different camps, <coughs> philosophies, ideologies, and we're all bickering, you know, we can't come together. The whole world can't come together. It's all impossible. It's all hopeless. But that's right. Within this room is a microcosm. Within yourself is a microcosm of the whole universe and the whole world and the whole human race. All represented right here. And we demonstrate it to ourselves and the universe. We can come together. It's not impossible. <clears throat> we can't say it was me or Paul or Charles or anybody. It's all of us. We're not just inconsequential 
nothing, no impact. So, what is inner tracking? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna run a workshop called um, the inner tracking, and not how, how not to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Can I be a guest speaker? <laughs> I'll be a star witness. <laughs> I just want something really personal just happened for me. This is not to open up this again, and it's not to Bring do it anything. But, but, no, no, no. <laughs> I guess I want to personally thank every single person that I spoke with, every single person that I didn't speak with. For a gift that in these final moments, that I have lived with Paul for many years. He's been, this has been his life work before I knew him, while I've known him, and that there's not that often where he feels, or where I see him feeling and expressing a hope that it can really happen. So that I, I have in my life really seen him work hard and relentless and feel the pain, not just his own, but everybody's pain, and continue to go on out there. But I just feel that for me, I don't know about for him, but for me it was such a gift for this to happen. For what I guess I think I'm, is happening for him, I don't know. It's kind of hard because there's not a lot of separation about it. So that was just like, it, it just in these final moments just totally blew my socks off. I just want to say, really, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's like, I'm just so full. <laughs> Whoa. Be watch. called Sheriff. <laughs> okay. Sheriff's on the way. <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> <laughs> I've made a promise to myself and to all my friends around me that come fall, I'm going to take a different path in traffic. You know, it's going to be all about just doing it for the sake of doing it, for having fun, for being happy, and just having no agenda at all. And uh, that that feels good. To me. You know, I just look forward to seeing where that brings me.
kind of fun. I haven't been out uh, tracking for a while. <laughs> And you can see some of these, you can see those both have just about the same consistency in time and how woody they are. Mm -hmm. Same color to the scat. Like to throw something in if I could? Yeah, of course. How are you learning this? George has given you all kinds of information and all kinds of details about the scat, which I would do as well. But are you learning it by collecting and categorizing all that information in your brain? How are you really learning that? To me, tracking is about observation. And you'd be surprised how many people just take in all the information and don't actually look at the details. Are you so concerned with, you know, constructing your mental set, getting your mental set validated, pushing your mental set on other people? You know, are you so concerned with that, that you're not going to have the chance, you know, and am I too, not going to have the chance to really ask why did this happen here? What are these points that each you know, camp or whatever are bringing about. How am I reacting to them? What is the truth here? 